Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our uh, Good Friday worship service, a uh, service of tenebrae, which means darkness. And uh, if you are familiar with this service that we have celebrated uh, the past uh, six years um, in the sanctuary, you will know, you will remember that we gradually, um, the place, the location gradually gets darker and, and darker as we turn off the lights and candles one at a time. So I encourage you to do that in your home or wherever it is that you're watching, if you can. That's what we'll be doing here. We'll be turning off lights. Um, if you have candles available, if you have seven candles that you can, or seven or eight candles that you can, you can blow out one at a time after each reading, that would be great. Uh, unfortunately, we cannot do that here because we live in a, uh, a rented house and the smoke detectors are very sensitive here. All it takes is one candle somewhere in the house to set off smoke detectors. So we are not going to do that this evening. Instead, we are going to re rely on our electric lights. Um, uh, this service will be uh, uh, after a short uh, call to worship and, and, and prayer. Um, this service will be a series of readings, which will be the last words of Jesus on the cross. And we've taken these readings uh, from uh, um, Adam Hamilton's book, Final Words, as well as uh, the seventh one from uh, <clears throat> Seven Last Words by Richard and, and Charlene Fairchild. Um, so, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> so let us begin then. Okay, um, I'm going to begin with the call to worship and as usual with the call to worship, there's a leader's line and then there's the, the people respond. Um, feel free to respond. Um, Tom will be responding so you can follow along with him. But if you have your worship guide, it'll have the words in it. And um, so let's join now in the call to worship. The God our ancestors trusted is with us, the servant despised and rejected, calls us together. We cry out to God and find no answers. Jesus, whom we seek, has been taken from us. We are people of the new covenant in Jesus Christ. Therefore, have confidence to enter your room. God seems so far away from our groaning. How can we believe what we have heard? God will fulfill all that is promised. Trust in God, who will rescue and deliver you. How can another die to save us? We stand at the cross in terror and confusion. Now, if you'd like, you can click on the uh, song that's listed in your worship guide or that may be in your, your, the comments, um, Beneath the Cross of Jesus by the Maranatha Promise Band. And then uh, pause your vi this video first and then uh, click on the song and then return to this video. Let us now join in a pastoral prayer. Oh, gracious and caring God, we come to you this, this evening uh, fully aware of uh, the sacrifice that has been made for us. And so on this somber evening, um, as we come together, um, from wherever we are in, in physically separated locations, but we come together through the wonders of technology. We remember this horrible day, the day that Jesus was crucified and died on the cross for our sakes, for our sins. And so we pause to remember that, O oh God. And we pause to confess our own sins for which he died. For which he died this horrible death. Thank you, God, for loving us so much. 
that you died for us. And as we gather in our own homes, or when we're, or for those of us who are alone, we pray your protection upon us, O oh God. We pray for your guiding care to be with us. And we pray, God, for brothers and sisters who are ill. We pray for your healing care to be upon them. We pray, O oh God, for others, for us and for others in our community, especially those who are on the front lines. We pray for your protection and for strength. We pray, God, for medical staff, for healthcare workers, doctors, nurses, and all who are in healthcare, whether it's in hospitals or nursing homes or wherever they may find themselves. We pray, God, that you might just comfort them, be with them, and protect them. May they know your presence with them, O oh God. We pray for our first responders. We pray that you might protect them as well. Surround them with your care. And we pray for all the people who are in public who have to work. We pray, oh God, that your protection might be with them. We also pray for those who can't work, those who are unemployed, those who are struggling financially in the midst of this crisis. We pray an end to this crisis soon. And we pray, God, that people might be able to get back to work, that they might be able to get their lives back. We pray for families with children who are having to deal with this at home and, and, and just finding new ways to educate their children. We pray for their patience, for their love and for their care. And we pray for the children, oh God, who, who may not even understand what is going on and why they have to stay in, in one place. And we just pray for your care to be with them. And we pray for our leaders, leaders in government and business, in, in church and wherever we are, that you might give them wisdom and that they might take the proper precautions and that you might be with us all in the midst of these days, that we might find hope in you, that our hope might always be found in your presence in our lives, and that our full trust might be in you. For we pray this all in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Um, these are selected verses from Luke chapter 23. Hear the word of the Lord. As they led him away, they seized a man, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming from the country, and they laid the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. When they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. We had spent two weeks sailing the north coast of Africa to celebrate the Passover in Jerusalem. My sons were small boys, yet old enough to feel the excitement as we approached the holy city. As our small caravan came over the last hill, Rufus let out a shout, Look, Father, the temple! There she stood, the earthly palace of God, gleaming as she towered over the city. Though my family had lived in Cyrene for generations, Jerusalem was for us. As every Jew, our heart's home. That night, we joined our cousins in Bethany for the Passover Seder that marked the beginning of the festival 
sharing a meal, and recalling God's salvation of our people. We ended that meal, as we did every year, praying for the coming of the Messiah. The next morning, Rufus, Alexander, and I left early to spend the day in Jerusalem, visiting the temple and then the festival taking place near the markets. As we approached the city, we saw what appeared to be a parade coming our way, but soon we could see that this was no parade. There were Roman soldiers driving three criminals toward the rock quarry where criminals were crucified. Each of these criminals was carrying a heavy beam across his shoulders. One clearly had been badly beaten, for his body was bloodied and he looked as though he could barely walk. I took Rufus and Alexander by the hand and pulled them away from the road. I did not want them to see this terrible thing. Just then, the tragic figure, the sorely wounded man, stumbled and fell at my feet. I saw that his brow was wrapped in a crude crown of thorns, and suddenly I realized who this man was. This was Jesus of Nazareth, whom some had claimed was the Messiah. He had been critical of the Jewish leadership in Jerusalem. I could not believe it. They had actually sentenced him to death. Everything happened so quickly. I was lost in my thoughts when I heard one of the soldiers say, You there, you carry his cross, and you, Jesus, get to your feet. There was nothing I could do. I told my boys, stay close. I picked up the beam, far heavier than I had imagined, and pitched it over my shoulder. Then I reached out a hand to Jesus to help him up. He was clearly in pain, but there was still in his face a strength and determination. He looked me in the eyes as if to thank me, and then he set his face toward Calvary. It was only a five minute walk to the place they called the Skull, Calvary, where the Romans crucified their victims. Dropping the beam before the executioners, I stepped back, searching for my boys, and we stood and watched as they assembled the cross. They stripped Jesus naked and laid him atop the beams. They stretched his arms to the sides before they drove spikes into his wrists as he shouted in pain. Then they nailed his ankles into the side of the cross, one on the right and one on the left. Finally, they hoisted his cross up and in position, and as they did, he let out another shout of pain. Because I had never been so close to a crucifixion, I had not realized what a horrible thing this was. Rufus began to cry. Alexander became nauseous. There were two thieves being crucified with Jesus, and the soldiers hoisted each one into the air. The Romans shouted to the crowd, Take a look at your king now. This is a lesson from Rome. Don't forget it. The soldiers, laughing, began to throw dice for his clothing. Some in the crowd wept. Others hurled insults at him. The religious leaders stood with their arms crossed, a strange expression of satisfaction upon their faces. And Jesus took a deep breath, and someone in the crowd said, Shh, he's about to say something. This is what he said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. I would never forget these words. A dying man, tortured and crucified, praying that God would forgive his tormentors. What kind of man would do such a thing? His words would haunt me the rest of my life. Ultimately, they would be the reason I became one of his followers. Let us pray. Father, forgive them. Father, you know their heart and you know my pain. I pray for those who hurt me. Forgive them and heal me. Amen. <clears throat> From Luke 23, verses 32 and 39 to 43. <clears throat> Two others also, who were criminals, were led away to be put to death with him. One of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding him and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God? since you are under the same sentence of condemnation, and we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, 
remember me when you come into your kingdom? And he replied, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. The thief on the cross, he looked at me with compassion. It had been a long time since I had felt anyone's compassion. My mother died when I was seven, and my father was a drunkard whose idea of encouragement was to call me an idiot and tell me to leave him alone. So I did. I began committing petty crimes when I was 10. I had committed armed robbery when I was 15, and I killed a man before I was 20. I was a hopeless cause. And here I was, 47 years old, carrying my cross on the way to Calvary. It was amusing to me that Jesus of Nazareth was being crucified with us. I knew of him. Some among my friends had gone to hear him. Jesus had even eaten with them. I knew some of the girls who had found religion by listening to him. They claimed he was God's Messiah. Strange Messiah, befriending sinners and prostitutes. If I believed in God, that's the kind of Messiah I would want. But I didn't, and so I wasn't sure he wasn't. Yet I can tell you this, I could not take my eyes off him. A huge crowd came out for his crucifixion. The money changers, the religious leaders, the Romans, and all those religious hypocrites. They stood around him, hurling insults at him. I joined in at first, glad they weren't insulting me, but even I didn't have the stomach for it. It was then I heard him praying from the cross. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. I was stunned. This friend of sinners prayed for mercy for his enemies? He turned and looked at me as if he could see right through me. And once more, he looked at me with compassion. Even in my pain, I found myself drawn to this man. If, as some said, he was sent from God, and if God was like this man, showing mercy to sinners, then perhaps there was hope for me. <clears throat> Levi, my partner in crime, began to hurl insults at Jesus once more. I shouted, Levi, stop it! Don't you see? We're getting what we deserve. He's done nothing wrong. And then... For reasons I still don't understand, I turned to Jesus and said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. But he replied, truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Let us pray. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. I want to be with you in paradise. Help me to reach out and love non-religious and nominally religious people so that they might see your love through me. Amen. Now reading from John 19, verses 25 to 27. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother, and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her to his own home. Mary, the wife of Clopas. I begged her not to follow as Jesus was led to be crucified. Mary, it will be too hard. You don't want to see this. But she said to me, I will not let my son die alone among these wolves. And so we went, joined by only one of his disciples, the young John, and by Mary of Magdala. Jesus' mother was a strong and determined woman, and she loved her son as much as any woman ever loved a son. He was to her the joy of her life 
and the purpose of her existence. Jesus had sought to prepare her for what lay ahead in Jerusalem. Somehow she had always known he would die as a young man, giving his life to save the world. Mary was determined to stand near Jesus as he suffered. She would fight to hold back tears, seeking to show her son strength and love. She would do all she could, standing there, to ease his pain and to give him hope. As the crowd hurled their insults, Mary slowly pushed her way through until she stood before him. There he hung, naked so as to humiliate, and in wretched pain. Jesus' feet were two feet off the ground, and from where Mary stood, she could reach up and touch his chest, though Roman guards forbade such things. As we stood there, Mary said to Jesus, I love you, my son. Your father will soon come for you. You are in his hands. I love you. It was then that Jesus looked at his, mo at his mother and spoke slowly and tenderly to her. Dear woman, this now is your son. He turned his head toward John. And then to John, he said, here is your mother. John placed his arms around Mary and held her as if to say to Jesus, I understand, I will take care of her. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your mother, Mary. Her witness, courage, and love for you were most profound. Help me to heed your call to John and hear it as my own so that I might care for my parents and children, and so that I might see those who have no parent or child as my own parents and children and care for them. Amen. If you would like, you could now pause this um, <clears throat> video and uh, click on uh, the song, The Old Rugged Cross by Selah, which is in your worship guide or in your the comments section. <clears throat> And then when you return, you can resume uh, this video. <clears throat> A reading from Mark 15, verses 29 through 36. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, Aha! You who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priest along with the scribes, were also mocking him among themselves, saying, He saved others, and he cannot save himself. Let the Messiah, the King of Israel, come down from the cross now, so that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also taunted him. When it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And when some of the bystanders heard it, they said, Listen, he is calling for Elijah. And someone ran, filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink. man in the crowd. It was a morbid sense of security that made us stop. We were on our way to the city on the first day of the festival when we noticed the crowd watching as three men hung nailed to Roman crosses. It was a gruesome way to die, hanging by the hands and feet with the added humiliation of being stripped of clothing and slowly dying as breathing became increasingly impossible. For all its horror, we were drawn to, the, to take a closer look at the suffering inflicted on these men. I was embarrassed to be watching, yet unable to turn away. It was clear as I looked around the crowd that there was something unusual about the man in the center. Some were hurling insults at him. Three women stood weeping near him, and he'd clearly been flogged the bloody stripes giving witness to the cruelty of his captors. I asked what he had done wrong. Someone in the crowd answered, that's Jesus, the man from Galilee, 
who many believed would lead the revolt to expel the Romans. But this way of dealing with the Romans was to tell his followers to show them kindness. He seemed more intent on revolting against Sanhedrin. It was they who convinced Pilate that he was a threat to Roman rule. So here we are with a pacifist preacher crucified as a threat to the emperor. The crowd around Jesus was restless. Some of the merchants seemed to gloat that he had cast them out, that he had cast them out of the temple court a few days earlier and was now getting his just reward. I'd like to say that as we watched this scene unfold, our hearts were filled with compassion, but it was quite the opposite. The anger and venom of others was like an infection rapidly spreading to each of us. My friend Levi was the first to join the act, saying he got what he had coming to him. He preached salvation, but look at him now. This friend of drunkards and prostitutes couldn't save a soul. My friend Jacob looked up at Jesus and shouted, Who do you think you are anyway? Some kind of Messiah you've turned out to be. Look at you, naked, bleeding, dying. Levi picked up the refrain. I'm sick just looking at you. Get it over with already. As I listened to them shouting, hate began to well up in me. This man hadn't done anything to me, yet as the others were shouting, I found myself filled with anger. I walked up to him and said, Some Jew you are, you make me sick. Tell us to love our enemies. This is what happens to people who love their enemies. Listen, you're a nobody. And then I spat on him. I don't know why I did that. He hadn't done anything to me. In fact, by all accounts, he was a good man. But somehow, hearing the priests and the religious leaders mocking him, my friends hurling insults at him, and even the thief on the cross next to him maligning him, a kind of evil seized my heart. I discovered that day that I had the capacity to hate an innocent man and a sick desire to be part of making him hurt. It was after I shouted at him then he looked up to the heavens and shouted the words of the psalmist, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When I heard him cry out, I was filled with shame. My God, what had we done? Let us pray. Forgive me, Lord, for the times I, like those who stood at the cross, have acted with cruelty. Thank you for identifying by your suffering with all who ever felt forsaken or cry, or cry, why help me to trust in you in my own times of adversity. Amen. The Gospel of John, chapter 19, verses 28 and 29. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture i thirst a jar full of sour wine stood there so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth nicodemus i was drawn to jesus since the first time i laid eyes on him three years later i stood by as he was crucified my name is nicodemus and the first time i heard jesus speak was in jerusalem he preached with power and conviction, and his words were accompanied by the most remarkable deeds. The sick were healed, sinners came to God, and demons were cast out. He had a knack, however, for alienating my colleagues in the Sanhedrin. He healed on the Sabbath, he did not follow our rituals and customs, and he had the irritating habit of pointing out our sins. Yet perhaps for these very reasons I was drawn to him. I could not let my colleagues know of my interest in this radical preacher. When I finally met with him, I requested a meeting by night so that no one would see us together. It was at that meeting that he looked me in the eyes and said, Nicodemus, you must be born again. You must be born of not only water, but the spirit as well. What an utterly odd thing to say. 
but it was just like Jesus. I left him that night confused, feeling like I, a scholar and leader among our people, was a mere child in the eyes of this man. Once more, I was deeply drawn to him. The night before Jesus was crucified, the Sanhedrin had been called together for a hastily arranged meeting. My heart sank when Jesus was brought in by the temple guard. I'm ashamed to say that I was silent as the others called for his death. I wanted to speak up for him, but I was too afraid. I knew I could lose everything if I spoke out against the high priest and others involved in this charade. Even now I'm embarrassed to tell you of my cowardice. That night he was sentenced to die, and I said nothing. I was so ashamed I dared not even look up at him as he stood there like a lamb before, my, before butchers. The next morning as they led him to be crucified, I wanted to run and hide. Yet I knew by my silence I had allowed this to happen. I decided that at least I could have the courage to show up and see what my silence had brought. I wanted him to see in my eyes my sorrow and pain and the deep regret I felt in not speaking out for him. The women came to him just before he was crucified. They were given permission to offer him one last drink. The Romans did not know that the women, in compassion, had laced the cup of wine with poison, meant to deaden the pain and to hasten his death. He tasted it, but noting its bitterness and understanding what they were doing, he refused to drink it. I turned away as he was nailed to the cross, and then watched in silent agony as his cross was raised. I listened as my fellow priests hurled insults. Still, I was silent. After some time, the soldiers mocked him, offering him wine, a kind of toast to the crucified king, but they kept it just out of reach as he sought to drink. Near the end of the ordeal, after he had hung there for six hours, he spoke again. He hadn't said a word in hours. He said, I thirst. I could not stand it anymore. At this point, watching him die, I found some small amount of courage. I no longer cared what anyone thought. I took a branch, fastened a sponge to it, dipped it in wine, and lifted it to his lips. He drew from the sponge, and shortly after, he breathed his last. Let us pray. Lord, be for me the source of living water. May my heart thirst after nothing as much as it thirsts after you. And may I, as one of your followers, extend water, both physical and spiritual, to all who are thirsty. Amen. <clears throat> A reading from Luke 23, verses 45 to 47. The curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. The centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. It was a job for angry men, men who had been abused as boys and those who were adept at compartmentalizing their work into the dark recesses of their mind when they came to the end of the day. We would brutalize men, drive spikes into their hands and feet and gamble for their final earthly possessions and watch them die. Then we would go home and have supper with our wives and children. It was about 8.30 in the morning when we led Jesus and the others to Calvary that day. I knew of Jesus. A friend stationed in Galilee told me how he had gone to Jesus and asked him to heal his servant. And Jesus never touched a servant. He merely spoke a word and the man was made well. My friend was convinced it was a miracle. My friend told me that Jesus was not like the typical would-be messiahs. He wasn't raising up as <clears throat> an army to drive us out of the country. He taught the people to love their enemies, to pray for those who harassed him, and to turn the other cheek when struck. 
I told my friend that we could use a few more like him in Judea. Yet, here he was being marched to the skull, the place of crucifixion, after having been beaten and bloodied by men. As I looked at him, naked, the crown of thorns upon his brow, for the first time in a long time, I felt deep regret for what I was about to command my men to do. Yes, this was my job, and he was just a Jew, pushing back any semblance of compassion from the recesses of my mind. I gave the order for them to nail him to the tree. I watched as dark clouds rolled in at noon. An eerie feeling lingered for three hours. It was as if the heavens themselves were proclaiming the darkness of the deeds we were witnessing. Something felt dreadfully wrong. Then a small earthquake shook the ground. Some people fled in fear, terrified that this might be the sign from God. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out, I thirst. One of the religious leaders surprised me by breaking away from his colleagues and giving Jesus a drink. And then Jesus said, it is finished. What a strange thing to say as he approached his death. This was a cry of victory, a man successfully completing a mission. I stood there looking at this man and I was overwhelmed by a sense of fear. What had we done? I turned to my men and said to them, Surely this man was innocent. He was, as he claimed, the Son of God. And for the first time in years, I wept. Let us pray. Lord, I do feel peace when I trust that you are with me always. I feel hope when I trust that you triumph over the grave. Breathe on me your Holy Spirit and grant me the power and courage to tell others of your love and to invite them to follow you. You are my crucified and risen Savior. Amen. Before we uh, finish with the seventh word and the words from Isaiah, um, you know that when we meet in the sanctuary for this service, we give you the instructions that at the end of the service to leave in silence, that there is nothing further to be said until Easter morning. I would like to offer up an alternative to that for this particular um, different circumstances that we find ourselves in. Um, I'm calling Saturday, Silent Saturday. And what I would like to suggest is, you know, we are watching this, we are worshiping together through the wonderful privileges of having technology and this wonderful technology of social media. And while I believe that social media and technology is a good thing that keeps us connected, you know, we can, we can Facebook, we can Instagram, we can email each other, we can text each other. But here's what I'm suggesting, suggesting for silence. Let's be silent for Saturday, for one day from social media. Let's be silent from Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, texting, email. I recognize that we still need to use our phones to call people in emergencies, but let's just be silent from social media. So what I'm suggesting is that when we leave this place, there's nothing at the end of this service, there's nothing further to be said on social media until Easter morning. 
Then Jesus, crying with a loud voice, said, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. It is the end, the very end of the ordeal, the end of the suffering. And Jesus, alone on the cross, tortured, exhausted, abandoned by his friends, forsaken by God, gasps for, his, for a last breath, and gathers the strength for one final cry. Why would he choose to speak so close to the end? Why would he muster the last energy he had to cry out with a loud voice? Couldn't God have heard his thoughts? Unless God wasn't the only one intended to hear. Unless his voice was pitched loud so that we too might hear this final dedication of his soul. A dedication made despite the pain, despite the mocking, despite the agony, despite the sense of horrible aloneness he felt. A dedication made to God before the resurrection, before the victory of the kingdom, before any assurance other than that which faith could bring. Jesus entrusts his spirit, his life, and all that has given it meaning to God in faith even at the point of his own abandonment, when the good seems so far away, he proclaims his faith in God. The darkness cannot overcome it. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. I suggested after these last words from Isaiah that you... Uh, Click on the bit on the uh, song. Were you there? Surely, he took up our infirmities, and he carried our sorrows. Yet, we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. And he was pierced for our transgressions, and he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. <laughs>